Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. And these are skateboarding comics. There aren't very many skateboarding comics, Ed. Whenever I started doing Street Angel, uh, who is a skateboarding character, I started to put together skateboard comics collection I, and ninja comics collection. The uh, ninja comics outnumber the skateboard comics 10 to 1 at least. Easily and believable. May, maybe maybe much more, much bigger numbers than that. But uh, I thought I'd show off a couple of these standouts. And uh, I'm going to begin with Shred, which is published by CFW. CFW, you may recognize as Tales of the Ninja Warriors and Tales of Kung Fu Warriors. Oh, yeah, I have those. Yeah, pretty popular. I see these in, in kind of back $1, issue. $1 magazine bins. Exactly. That, that's the, the part that makes it difficult is the magazine size. They published the first issue of Shred magazine size, and then after that it goes to, on to regular comic book size. Um, these aren't too uncommon, although none of these skateboard comics are totally common, and some are very difficult, like the Thrasher stuff is hard to find. But the Shred I occasionally see in, in dollar boxes, 50-cent boxes, stuff like that. And uh, first thing to note is Ted McKeever cover. This is dated 88, and I think it's just a badass cover. I always like this image. And this is your title character. This is actually Shred. He had, like, the spiky shoulder pads, the skull mask, and you can see him on uh, some of the other covers because these were, like, recurring characters. Skate culture and comics feel like cousins to me in terms of, like, their sort of status level in pop culture. That's a pretty good one. Uh, so it, it, this is a this marriage makes sense. Yeah, and I'm going to show off a couple of different, um, you know, like I said, there aren't a ton of skateboard comics. So, like, the biggest series are definitely Shred and Thrasher, the biggest ones that I have found, and they both run around nine issues. Um, they're both anthology approaches. Uh, we're actually going to look at a third title, too, Road Rash, also anthology approach. The difference is Shred had these recurring characters. So, in addition to Shred, there was a character named Cyborg, which I always thought was kind of a cool name for a, uh, a skateboard character. And these are like vigilante comics, you know? Like, this is totally in place with your 80s black and white, you know, explosion-era comics. It just happens to have a skateboard as a twist. So, this crime-fighting vigilante shows up that's and kicks ass. Fucking, <laughs> that's a good fucking splash right there. Yeah, and he uses his skateboard much like Captain America would use a shield. Uh, whenever he's taking down this this gang of street toughs, you know, bouncing off walls, hitting hitting guys in the face. I like that he has beyond those urethane wheels, man. <laughs> he's got heads yeah. on that shit. Yeah, I don't know how effective those are. I'd have to talk to a skate professional. Yo, Stacey Peralta, man, when are we doing that shoot interview? But I do like the character design, again, totally 80s, you know, spike knee pads. So building on some of the pieces that would be part of a skateboard uh, culture. Anything... Uh, kind of over the top or, or kind of controversial because like skate skateboard culture it's about pranksterism and being being a nuisance and and being kind of counterculture uh we spoke with dave gibbons recently and he he mentioned that term that i sort of forgot about for the longest time but he mentioned ground level comics this is a ground level comic from the looks of it man uh, it's not mainstream it doesn't fit into fantagraphics uh in any way but it's like attempting to be kind of like your standard kind of comic, nothing, nothing uh, beyond the comics code kind of energy. Yeah, a lot of the stuff I think of that era is that way. Like even the things that are outside Marvel, DC, nobody was pushing things too far, uh, with a couple of exceptions. And and this falls very comfortably within that. Uh, I wanted to note there's a couple pages in here that are reproductions of pencils, so it's like a preview for future issues. But kind of a cool thing if. You know, I always like to see that behind the scenes and process. I don't recognize any of the artists that work on this. The main editor guy, Roy Burdine, Burdin, is in, uh, you know, he's kind of the overseer, I think, of putting this together. But then the individual artists aren't, aren't necessarily people I recognize. This is Art and Letters by Rance Hosley. Good energy, man. There's, there's a lot of motion in that in that splash. Yeah, these are nice looking comics. And like I said, they, they do, you know, they publish, I don't know, a dozen plus issues of both of these series. So like they are producing professional comics, you know, compared to maybe a self-publisher or like a one-off. And uh, and maybe we'll show a couple of a couple versions of that. But they were definitely working with a series of artists. Another one of these pencil uh, preview pages for upcoming issue. 
much tighter pencils here, much better reproduction than that earlier page. Has the uh, the Dave Sim High Society lettering caption borders, man? Like that that little Tinkerbell would would uh, she would talk in this? Very of the time. <laughs> yeah. uh, other names here. So Frank Gomez is your art here. Uh, Derek Gross, creative director, and he's through a lot of these, and a lot of times it's inking is uh, the credit that he gets. But um, I see, I think, I see uh, Shred showing up in the sideboard uh, strip. <laughs> They're already crossing over. It's a universe. Right, exactly. Pretty good looking stuff, though. Um, this is the era, too, where there were these independent publishers, and uh, if you wanted to work for Marvel, you would do your tenure at one of these like small gimmicks. Like None of these... None of these artists seem like they are a part of like skate culture or have that kind of energy. They're just doing a job uh, in hopes of drawing spectacular Spider-Man one day. That's a good point, Ed. This is probably one of the... Um, this is definitely less skateboardy in terms of skate culture than, say, Road Rash or Thrasher comics. But you're pretty spot on with your idea of maybe doing Marvel. So <laughs> there's your Marvel version of a skateboard character. And it's equally not uh, skate culture. So uncool. Totally. But possibly the perfect character for somebody from Shred to uh, move to one of the big two. You see something like this, and it just reinforces Jack Kirby's coolness that he could make like a Silver Surfer work. Because that is, I mean, orange and yellow. Come on, man. Popular enough to make a couple of appearances, though. Ross Andrew cash and checks. <laughs> Rocket racer back in town. Ro Ross Andrew cash and checks. So Shred goes on. You know, it's, it's pretty much the same as this first issue, uh, just in comic book size. And some different artists come through, of course. But it is pretty nice art. Yeah. Uh, you know, some of the artists, for sure. Um, this is the same art team as issue one. I had that one, Zipatone. And, and you can see totally that these I guys... Had Zipatone. Oh, yeah? Yeah. You can see totally, Ed... You mentioned Marvel DC type art, and I think that's a pretty good description of what you're seeing there. It's polished inking style. Yeah, you present this to Marv Wolfman and see if he lets you do a Marvel fanfare fucking inventory strip. Yeah, exactly. So that's basically Shred. Again, you can find these in back issue bins occasionally. Um, they're okay. They're not extraordinary, but... Not a lot to choose from in the skateboarding comic book let me, category. Let me ask you this, man. So, so yeah, you're doing Street Angel, and she has a skateboard. Uh, what is the what is the value of uh, the, what do you what do you get from this, man? Getting these ninja comics or skateboard comics? Like, like, what's the point? Oh, that's a good question. I, I guess to see what other people do. In some cases, to avoid that, and in some cases, to be like, that's a really cool idea to do with ninja powers or to show skateboarding. Yeah. Um, skateboarding, especially, is so visual. You know, like. I look at skateboard magazines and, and photos and videos and stuff also mm -hmm. as reference points. So I don't know, man. It's just, it's reference, really. Research and reference. So things to avoid, but also things to be like, this is a cool way to show a skateboard or to, you know, show a trick or, or take this trick and put it on the side of a building instead of a, a pool or something. Right. So uh, Thrasher Comics, obviously same publisher as Thrasher Magazine, one of the big skateboarding magazines, especially of the 80s. And, uh, this is post black and white boom. I think these are dated 1988. So we talk about 1986 as being the apex of that black and white boom. I think they looked around and were like, "Oh yeah, this is uh, there's there's money to be made in 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 the comic book market." And actually, the, well, the publishers of Thrasher, like like I I got I caught dinner with uh, the publisher one time, and uh, they also own um, uh, Juxtapose. So they're very visually literate. Yes, and uh, it's no surprise that they would they would dabble in here. I mean, when I when I got dinner with them, I was, uh, Robert Williams was there. Doubles of issue five. Um, yeah, Ed, you're you're spot on with their visual literacy. Whenever I first started picking Thrashers up, what it reminded me of was underground comics. You know, because they are these anthology formats. And I think Spain Rodriguez. Does I was going to say Spain right? Rodriguez, absolutely. This is funny that this first one has this color story because I did not remember color being in these. Yeah, and it's real shitty too. Yeah, it is very bizarre. That is awesome though. Yeah. And I don't know who this is. Casey Jones is the artist. Also, that's the cover artist. And I think the cover art is really strong. I do too. And you can see some of the, the, the screen tones and stuff. And it makes sense. My impression is it's like half cartoonist that you would recognize. You mentioned Spain Rodriguez and we're going to see some of his work in future issues but then i think the other half is coming from like staff artists and freelancers that these skateboard companies would work with because i think there's a lot of uh cross influences 
Yeah, uh, and there's a, there's a whole culture in Hot Rod Art and Big Daddy Roth. Uh, we'll we'll see it in when we look at uh, Road Rash, definitely. But like, there it is, man. That's one of them. He's in a lot of these issues. Yeah, yeah. These are pretty fun. If if you like Spain Rodriguez, it's definitely worth trying to find these. And I think you can find them online, if not uh, physical copies, which are a little bit hard to come by. But I enjoy these a lot. Like they're pretty fun comics. A lot of them are, you know, feature motion and action and stuff. And they're cartoons. You know, it's like these cartoon characters. Um, he has a granny character that skateboards through several of these issues. So again, reminded me whenever I first got hold of a couple of these, a lot of like the, they're in California. You know, a lot of the underground kind of stuff. And I, I have a feeling that that's probably, you know, they're pulling some people from. I mean, I feel, I feel like I feel like the person that made this, they 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 at least know who Victor Moscoso is. Yeah, for sure. And uh, Granny McGurk. And see, there's there's like a Big Daddy Roth vibe right right there. That's like a that's like a Rat Fink type type character, man. Yeah, it must be a pen name, Johnny Childish signature. Love it. Oh, is this a leadoff Spain Rodriguez? Yeah, sure. yeah. Granny McGurk, classic lettering, classic yeah, Spain Rodriguez. Bullshit. Without anything that uh, I don't know might might be troublesome. Some of his stories I feel like age better than others. <laughs> this stuff is uh, is pretty innocent. I don't recognize this artist, but it reminds me a little bit of like I, I would guess they're fans of like a Gary Panther, mm. and probably a lot of the alternative comics. Yeah, the, the punk art aesthetic. Yeah, that's probably a better uh, better description for sure. See more of that Big Daddy Roth. Like, yeah, totally Johnny Johnny sense. Childish again uh, signature there. Great lettering, yeah, but fun cartooning. And it, and by the way, like uh, it was it was Robert Williams who drew a lot of that uh, Big Daddy Roth stuff, man. So it's it's all Wolverton vibes. You know what? I was gonna say Wolverton vibes with with these two, and then it was like, well, maybe not. But clearly, that's uh, strong Basil Wolverton influence there, yeah. big time. So these are pretty neat, yeah, and, and they run for. You know, several issues. I think I, I mentioned like seven or eight issues, I think, of this were published. Um, I have through issue seven here. I don't know if this is all of them or not. Oh, here's here's a number eight, number nine. So I think this is all of them, nine issues. And uh, another Granny McGurk. Spain Rodriguez is in the majority of these. He's not in all of them, but he's definitely in the majority of them. And it's just kind of like fun, you know, Ed, you, you ask about like uh, what might be an influence and it'd be stuff like this, like, oh, that's kind of cool. An upside down shot looks good. You know, the splat cover would be an example of that. This is not a skateboard comic. It's just a skateboard cover. And there are a few of those, like here's Frank Thorne doing a skateboard cover, but not really a skateboard comic. Um, but whenever I would see these in like a quarter bin, I pick them up because it's a skateboard. So let's see what, what kind of action is in there. Um, Nothing too special in those two, but these thrashers are full of it. And then I would say one more f kind of fun note for this. Oh, you know what? There's a, this artist, Coleman, Ellie Coleman, mm -hmm. pretty interesting artist, does a few comics scattered throughout here. Um, I even like this stuff, very underground, scratchy style. There's there's an element of, uh, in, in the more refined work from, from Thrasher and even, even uh, some of that shred stuff, uh, like pinball back glass is uh, uh, in this universe too. Yeah, like there, this kind of shit. There's a huge crossover, I think, between the influences that we have in comics and cartoonists have with skateboarding and illustration. Like, I think they all kind of inform each other. This is the worst cover. You should cover it up with that. Well, I want to mention this one because if you look closely, go ahead and touch it. What am I feeling? This is a bootleg. Oh, uh, I see. This is a this is an issue that a friend of mine had, and so he just photocopied and sent it to me, and uh, I cut it down to, to be the size of these because this was one that I I didn't find initially, and uh, I like this artist too. So a lot of these artists, like I would look them up, and it's they're not comics artists necessarily. They're I think they're illustrators that yeah. happen to be working, you know, skateboard somewhere in the skateboard industry. This uh this art here is very reminiscent of like late period. S. Clay Wilson from like Arcade Magazine would draw with that kind of rigor, and that lettering is very similar. This is that Ellie Coleman that I mentioned. He does a a, a skate alligator character in one of these, and I should have flagged it because I'm not going to find it now that I'm talking about it. Um, but he's in several of these things too, and, and they're all pretty good. 
There's a little more skate culture-y Yeah, and piss stuff. on a wall. <laughs> yeah, it's the unfortunate thing, though, man. It's, like, it's also toothless. Like, if, if there would have just been, like, one story where, you know, the kid has trouble with city ordinance or, like, the, the, the local cops or whatever, my homeboy, my homeboy, uh... Bill Shannon getting getting choked out by the policeman just for riding a skateboard like that. That's the real life. Like this is all just you know it's escapist and it is over it's, the top. it's very uh, toothless in that regard. This is the Johnny Childish that we pointed out a couple times, and uh, this reminds me a little bit of like fuck a tour, like some of the lettering and mm. stuff. Yeah, he's got EC vibes, man. I mean that's a Johnny Craig kind of signature. He he like mastered the way Johnny Craig writes Johnny. <laughs> That's a funny thing to, to think of as, like, having mastery over. So these are pretty strong. These took me a long time, like, as a comic book digger. Yeah. It took me a while to put together a run of these. Um, would you spend more than a quarter on any of that, or you were just digging in the quarter bins? I would spend more than a quarter on it, and I probably did spend more than a quarter on most of it because I did not find most of these in quarter bins. What would happen is I found, like, one issue in a quarter bin and then found out they existed. Yeah. And I would start to look online, and then it was harder to come by. And so... Those would come to me kind of in bits and pieces over time. Um, here's a black and white explosion era, uh, self-published kind of deal, Slate Skate. This is one that I would see several times in back issue bins, and uh, it is copyright 1986. So this is, again, black and white explosion era, you know, like like peak time. Not a lot of skateboard comics from that era, but this is one. And this reminds me a little bit of like a Vince Locke kind of style. Looks like a young Rodney Mullen. <laughs> Oh, they're using uh, Frank Miller storytelling, man. Four Tears. <laughs> 1986, man, post Dark Knight. So, got to do, got to, got to incorporate whatever the hot comics are. And look at that little fourth wall gimmick. Yeah, skating over the gutters, for sure. All right, so one of the the best of this bunch is a comic called Roadkill. This one is published by Santa Cruz Comics, or Santa Cruz Skateboards, and it's primarily the work of Jim Phillips, who was the longtime art director at Santa Cruz. And uh, I thought we would just kind of flip through some of his work in this book to kind of show off his comics' influence. And of course, um, very iconic, the, the stuff that he created as a skateboard designer. Yeah. That cover, I mean, the, the screaming face, because uh, 19, you know, mid middle 80s, uh, one of the very few anime that comes to America is Vampire Hunter D with that screaming with that screaming hand, and uh, you could go right out to the shop and see the skateboards at like Hills Department Store with with that exact logo. I mean, I bet that thing went platinum. Yeah. So this is uh, this piece in color, and here it is on the inside back cover of road rash and he has complete comics in road rash i'll flip through that in a minute but i just wanted to show off some of this stuff ed you mentioned the screaming hand this guy has an incredible career as an artist and illustrator and of course this was something i was drawing in elementary school yeah uh one of the you know most iconic images probably the built santa cruz man as far as i know i can't think of a more iconic santa cruz yeah image. for sure and he talks you know like the, there's talk about the development of this piece and how like bones and, and skulls and stuff were so big and he felt like the fleshiness of the hand was was the the other piece that you could do something with that would separate it a little bit from that uh from that bone and skeleton kind of stuff but you can see like it's he's totally loaded with that cartoon iconography and styles yeah and super prolific. So while he's working as art director, he's also doing other other work. Like he was working nonstop, essentially. He would get into painting on the side, things like that. So he's constantly working. You can see it in everything from like the letter design color to some of the drawing and like stippling and line work that he would be using. And even, you know, comics, whenever he got a chance to do some comics, would pop up here and there in different places. So Whenever they decided they were going to, uh, again, jump on the comics trend and put out a comic in the 80s, they were very lucky to have Jim Phillips on hand uh, because he's the perfect, like, like he had this already in his, uh, in, in his portfolio and certainly in his brain and skill set. Yeah, it's great. Uh, very often you can see illustrations that, that ring false. Uh, you could tell that it's a, it's a um, successful illustrator who has now accepted a job where he, they're tasked into 
drawing comic book style. And what their interpretation of comic book style is, very insulting to me. Uh, but this guy at least has it. Yeah, like you can see, the comics were always a big part. It's it's funny for stuff like this where it's almost like the the black and white line work is, to me, just coming right out of comics. Mm -hmm. Like I, I see like the Robert Williams and stuff, you know, with yeah. the chrome effects. They're such a part of comics language to me. Yeah, he could swing that brush, man. Um, there are those guys, you know, like I think of Coop as one of those dudes who, who like, they don't... I, this guy at least makes comics, but like Coop is down with comics. Coop likes them. You know, he's got Klaus pages on his wall. Uh, he uses that pen and ink line like with the best of them, but just doesn't do comics. Like it's cool that this guy actually like. And his background was more do. surf. You know, like surfing is what he. He, he, he looks older. Yeah. Yeah, he is older. He is older. And uh, surfing was kind of like where he enters this art world, and then that morphs from Santa Cruz surfboards into their skateboards. I wanted to flag this one because this is a car that he painted, and you can see the comic characters, you know, like clearly the comics were a big, big influence yeah. the, the whole time. And it's pretty neat as you get into like his later period, and he's, I don't know if retired is the right word, but he's doing more of his own stuff. So he's another one of those guys that we see now and then where it's like, they're constantly moving. You know, the guy doesn't retire and stop. It's just he gets to paint whatever he feels like painting or drawing. Um, there's some digital stuff, you know, in some of his work towards the end. So, again, like a guy who's engaged and continuing to push forward, you know, like I, I'm pretty sure this is a digital rendering. I'm always impressed by these guys that have decades of a very accomplished career that don't stop there. Yeah. It's like, oh, there's a new tool. I'm going to learn that tool, too. I mean, it's clearly the, the cloth that we're cut from. And, and I see us as crusty little old dudes, man, still <laughs> fucking around doing weird shit. Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully we reach that age. If the hands keep working. So, flipping through this road rash, uh, only one issue of this, but certainly on par and in line with like the thrasher comics and definitely more of that skater culture. And this is, this is Phillips story. He has a couple of pieces in here. Um, this is one of them. And you can, you can see for sure this guy is coming from comics background. Yeah. A lot of Robert Williams in this. That reminds me of sort of like that eighties alternative comic styles. A little bit more by the numbers, uh, maybe slightly less exciting. And then he has a piece in here. Not he. There is a piece in here, and it's by his son. So we'll take a look at that one if I can find it. I do love all these styles, though. Like, they feel like they're right in line with, uh, you know, with alternative comics, with indie comics. And think of this as, like, 1988. Like, this is not out of line for something you would find at Fanographics. True. Uh, this is his son's piece, so Jim Phillips Jr. I like this piece a lot. It's a finer line work than his dad, maybe a little bit less polished, but actually makes for a fun character. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's good. Like, I, I had to look at the credit to see if it was, a, I thought it was that J.H. Williams dude or somebody. It looked familiar. Yeah, this one's pretty good, and I, I hesitate to say that I actually have a double of this one, so this may be uh, something I pass on to a K. Faber at some point. And then this deluxe inside back cover image uh, by Phillips. And you would see, you know, if you go through his book, you see some of these images, they're repurposed. You know, mm -hmm. like a good illustrator uh, or somebody working for a skateboard company, a good image might be a skateboard deck. It might be then a T-shirt, uh, you know, some kind of package design, whatever, whatever the case may be, depending on how detailed it is. So in the case of this, we see a color version uh, early on in, in his book. And it stood out to me that the very first page of the book is actually a color panel from this comic book. So I think that tips you off a little bit of Jim Phillips and how much he loves comics. Super cool, man. And of course, you know, bringing this all home, it's Street Angel is the reason I got interested in skateboard comics and, and to see like what other people were doing, if there were things that I could take from them or if there were things that I could learn from them and avoid uh, certain pitfalls. Yeah, nice, man. And then otherwise, it's just uh, things that pop up oddball stuff that i find from time to time this is one that stood out to me i found this in a store in florida uh, biohazard skater die picked it up and it's like a zombie post-apocalyptic world where one of the characters is a skateboarder and it's sort of fun but also pretty strange very raw <laughs> yeah for sure and there's your skateboard action i don't know if those mechanics quite add up the the uh contrapasto was off man <laughs> yeah quite a bit quite a bit <laughs> 
Oh, and there's multiple issues of Biohazard? There are a couple issues of Biohazard, yeah. How about that? So there you go. Skateboard comics in a nutshell. Should we go and uh, make our own skateboard comics, Jim? I think the world could use more skateboard comics, Ed. Let's balance, dude. K Fabers, like, subscribe, follow the YouTube channel, hit that bell. We'll let you know when the next videos are available, and please do so. We're on that race to get 20,000 subscribers. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist K Fabe e newsletter at the link below this video. You can also find Cartoonist K Fabe merchandise and t shirts at the links below this video. I have to go white out the trucks of this skateboard I just drew. I realized I drew them on backwards, man. <laughs> Give them their marching orders, Jimmy. Read more comics.